So uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Karen Hurst. I work in the PLSA's policy team. Um, we are really pleased to be joined by two really good speakers today. We've got uh, Kerry Perkins and Emmy Coker, Louis Smith, both from Accounting for Sustainability. Uh, if you're not familiar, that was an organisation set up by the Prince of Wales in 2004 with the aim of making sustainable business the norm. Um, if you haven't checked out their website and some of what they do, please do. There's a huge amount of resource on there, which I think was really useful and really practical. Uh, but today specifically, we're going to be discussing a new toolkit, well, a toolkit that's been they've launched, um, especially for pension uh, scheme chairs and trustees, and it's to help with practical steps to embed ESG into investment decisions, reporting and engagement. So all certainly very topical. Um, we do have some polling questions, uh, which I'll uh, let Kerry set up when we get to them. So. Um, I, don't, I hope you'll vote and, and, and sort of let us know what you think about them. And as I say, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to stick them into the um, into the chat box or into uh, the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over firstly to Kerry, uh, who's going to sort of introduce what we'll be speaking about today. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, really pleased to be here with you. Um, I'm Kerry Perkins, um, as Karen said, and I head up our capital markets work within accounting for sustainability. Um, our mission statement um, is to make sustainable decision making business as usual. And I'm joined by my colleague, um, Emma Ko Kalui Smith. And the aim of this session is to provide an overview of our ESG. Um, toolkit for pension chairs and trustees suggests ways it can support you and although it's initially designed for trustees it can also be used by pension managers and service providers. Just first of all to put a little bit of context around this um, as the dust settles on COP we know that with the pledges made a 1.5 degree celsius future is still on life support. We saw commitments made around deforestation Methane, methane emissions, unabated and insufficient coal subsidies, and climate finance towards the developing countries. The Glasgow Financial Accord for Net Zero, also known as GFAND, announced that its members um, with a capitalization of 130 trillion US dollars announced they would align their investments with net zero emissions by 2030. And in the UK, standards for transition plans, which will include mandatory publishing of transition plans in the near future are to be incorporated into the UK's developing sustainability disclosure requirements as part of the UK's greening finance roadmap. There is a lot of detail to be filled in, but what is apparent is a mass surge of ambition from government, finance and business to embed the solutions to tackle climate change within their structures. And closely behind this is the issues of biodiversity, nature, social issues. Within the UK pension sector, I'm sure you have all noticed and felt a move over the past 12 months and even more around the business case to embedding ESG considerations into investment and strategic decision making processes. Russell Pico, who chairs the HSBC Bank UK pension scheme and also co-chairs our asset owners network, stated in one of our recent guides, from a traditional risk and return perspective, it now unquestionably falls within a trustee's fiduciary duty to consider and integrate climate impacts into investment decisions. This is recognising, of course, that a pension scheme's ability to provide long-term risk-adjusted returns to their members is threatened by the impact of climate change, both now and in the future. And this brings us back to why we're here today. The toolkit which we will describe, aims to give some helpful tools for trustees and others to firstly help drive consensus within the scheme on areas of priority and next steps, and secondly, provide some practical steps that can be taken. So firstly, to gather just a little bit of insight from you, we're going to invite you to please answer the following poll question. What do you feel is the biggest challenge to embedding ESG considerations into your decision making? And ask if you can just opt for the biggest challenge that you find. Hard, I know, but try. <laughs> OK, so it looks like the, uh, the winning challenge here is lack of reliable and consistent data to base investment decisions on. And um, this obviously um, is something that 
is being tackled everywhere and there is the, the hope that the, the newly formed ISSB will help with this. We also have the UK Centre for Greening Finance um, and Investment, which has been set up and aims to accelerate the adoption and use of climate environmental data. And of course, with the UK government's Greening Finance Roadmap, the sustainability disclosure requirements in development now will also aim to help with this. So there is there are steps forwards on that. And to, we, we are optimistic that there are um, mechanisms now in place to help address those issues and those challenges. Um, and then also you've, uh, the, the second one would be around the lack of knowledge and guidance on what steps next to, were, on what steps to take next. Um, and of course there are, you know, as a board, the, the lack of um, knowledge and experience to challenge the status quo, um, there'd be the lack of appropriate knowledge within the uh, service providers or a, a sense that there is. And this is where this toolkit is designed um, to help build um, the confidence in the trustees to, um, to then ask those questions, those difficult questions, either to their in-house investment teams or to their service providers. OK, thank you for that. If you could move that poll. Now moving on to the toolkit. So if we could start on the first page of the first slide. Oh, the second slide then. So the aim of this toolkit is it's toolkit resources that brings to life what good, lo what good looks like. Um, it is around inspiring action for predominantly for trustees, but as I said at the beginning, it can be very transferable for other parts of the UK pension industry. Um, on next steps to mature schemes ESG integration approach. And um, the aim is to support trustees in discussions with fellow trustees, consultants, fund managers about the practical actions they should take. And we aim for it to be transferable to different jurisdictions and sizes where appropriate. And also importantly to say, this is a live document. We are continually adding resources to this. So we would be really, really grateful to hear your thoughts after this of where are the gaps, where you would like more information about particular areas. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the, um, so the, the toolkit comprises of three areas. So we have the ESG maturity map. Um, this is with suggested steps that schemes can take to progress on their ESG integration journey. And this works best if you work with this hand in hand with the workshop brief. So this is meant as a workshop process, um, ideally to help drive consensus with, within the board around where you are, where you want to be. And Em is going to talk a little bit more detail about that. Then the next layer is the case study. So this is, we have established with the maturity map where the suggested steps are, what good looks like. And the case study really brings that, this to life. So these are pension related case studies that take a what, a why, and a how, and a top tips um, format. And then the guidance material is to provide that extra layer to highlight the practical steps on specific areas. This could be around, for example, embedding ESG factors into different asset class portfolios. Okay, next slide. And then I'm gonna hand over to Em. Thanks very much, Kerry. So as Kerry's um, explained, the uh, toolkit comprises these three parts. The first is an ESG maturity map, which outlines what good looks like across a number of different areas in terms of embedding ESG considerations into trustee investment decision making, uh, in terms of reporting and also engagement across the value chain. And we set this out at four levels. Those levels are understanding, adopting, deepening and leading. The maturity map can be used as a guide or perhaps an interactive workshop tool. Um, and it's, it's designed to show pension trustees and help them assess what they're currently doing and what steps they can take to make progress. So as an example, the investment stewardship um, row of this maturity map, and I think uh, Alicia is going to be sharing, uh, she has the, um, the link to the maturity map on the A4S website. The investment stewardship activities row uh, at level one understanding this is around a board confidently being able to speak about 
the role of asset owners in driving better corporate behavior around ESG integration. Whereas at level three, the deepening level, this would be um, about a, a board member being expected to attend at least one investee company AGM per year and also asking ESG related questions as part of that engagement process at that AGM. So that demonstrates how the levels are, are showing a deepening practice and maturing practice of ESG integration in that particular example or in terms of investment stewardship. The aim of the map is to drive consensus within a trustee board um, and also with their key players like their consultants, their investment consultants, for example. And that consensus is going to be around where people think they are on the maturity map, where they are in terms of ESG integration maturity, but also to help hone and focus where their priority should be and what the next step should be and what next step should be taken. We've tried to set it out in a way that's easy to digest with the bullet points at each level. Um, and really, it's designed to help trustees really focus on where their current position is and where they want to go next. We know from feedback that it helps to shape uh, discussions and it avoids people going down rabbit holes because it really uh, sets out at a high level where, where people need to be. If we could move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so after we created the maturity map with the with the four levels, we realized that actually there was a level zero and that's the compliance only level. So we've added level zero to the maturity map available through that link that Alicia shared. And that sets out the minimum requirements that UK pension schemes must comply with or, or need to start to um, start to think about complying with in order to meet the expectations of the UK Pension Schemes Act uh, 2021. If you move on to the next slide. And to try to bring this to life, A4S has also written an accompanying guide to help trustees to workshop the maturity map with their board. So this is a practical exercise that you can do with your board or if you're an advisor with the boards that you advise. And previous participants have said how this workshop process has really helped to drive consensus uh, across the board and to, um, to help them identify where their priorities should be and what the next steps they should focus on. And some schemes have also brought in their advisors, their fund managers, or, or even their executive team into the process. And Alicia has shared a link in the chat there for you to have a look at the workshop brief that we've written um, that, that sort of takes you through the step-by-step -step guide that you would need to go through in order to workshop the maturity map. And there's even some tips in there about how to make the most out of virtual, um, virtual contexts as well. Uh, if we move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, we've road tested this maturity map and also the workshop guide with a number of members of A4S's Asset Owners Network, which uh, tend to be chairs um, of uh, UK pension schemes at the moment. Um, here we've got some testimonials that highlight what they found of value. So Catherine Claydon, who is one of our members and chair of the BBC pension scheme and British Steel, has said that it was extremely useful to give trustees a picture of where we were, but also where we might aspire to be across different parameters. So it really acted as a great framework to prompt a thought provoking discussion around BBC and, and British Steel status, um, goals and specific areas to focus on when it came to climate risk. And then Marcus Heard, professional trustee at NDAPT, has talked about how it has um, enabled the trustees to be back in control of the agenda and how this helps trustees and, and, and peers to probe further into previous statements and responses from investment consultants, particularly around ESG integration. Um, so I'm gonna pause there. If we move on to the next slide, we should have a little questions break to see if anybody might have questions on the maturity map. I'm not sure if I've seen any in the chat, if there's any in a separate Q&A. We don't have any. So if, if you do have any questions on, on that, um... The, the map in particular, then do pop them in, and uh, we'll do our best to get back to them. I have a question, if that's all right. I just, mm -hmm. I just was what I was into what you were saying there. I mean, I, the polling results were reassuring, and that zero um, percent of our audience uh, felt that they that there was too much regulation, and that was preventing them from acting. And we're just, I mean, at the PLSA, we're very aware of um, 
just how much is coming at trustees at the moment, you know, in terms of uh, TCFD and, and in terms of uh, implementation statements. There's been some new announcements in the past couple of weeks from COP. Um, you know, individually, we can appreciate there's a purpose. I just wonder for those, you know, you've you mentioned the sort of level zero there. I just, you know, in terms of uh, smaller schemes and, you know, how they get beyond just focusing on doing the bare minimum, you know, do you think it's helpful as a sort of, um, you know, have you have you seen it's being used to sort of try to get them beyond that, but without feeling as though they, you know, need to set an ambitious target and, and do sort of everything? Is, is that been your experience? Yeah, we've had a number of webinars with um, smaller schemes and particularly professional trustees that work with a number of smaller schemes. And we've had this very conversation. So the level zero is designed to let people know what the bare minimum expectations are. And obviously, you know, from a compliance perspective, they're going to need to comply with the, the UK Pension Scheme Act. But the level one, I think, is written in a way that hopefully encourages those smaller schemes to start to think about the levels of knowledge and understanding in particular that the boards need to have in order to at least start their journey up the various levels of maturity. So level one is very much written about the understanding, the knowledge, the skills, the experience, the, the sort of the technical understanding that the trustees have on the board. Um, and we would hope that training and development of all trustees, including those of small schemes, would be something that's achievable. So hopefully that gives a nice entry level to get yeah, started. Absolutely, yeah. And we do have one question, apologies, uh, Julia. Um, so uh, a question from Julia is asking, how would this map um, onto the her funds aim to join the UK stewardship code? Yeah, so um, as I said, there is a row in the maturity map that specifically talks about engagement and stewardship. And we've written that with various uh, stewardship and engagement um, initiatives in mind in terms of best practice. So when we wrote what we were expecting to see as different levels of maturity across all of the topical areas of the maturity map, we took inspiration from best practice initiatives that were out there. And the UK stewardship code, the principles of that code are things that we considered when we wrote that that row so I think very much there is a direct read across between elements of the map and not just the stewardship code but also elements of other best practice initiatives that are that are out there Kerry I don't know whether you had anything specific to say on the stewardship code as well or no I would have just uh, repeated what you said <laughs> okay okay um, so I don't have any more questions, but if there are, if you do have any questions on that, we, we will have time at the end as well. So do feel free to um, to pop those into one of the boxes. OK. OK, so we can uh, carry on if we go to the next slide, please. I'm going to have a, a quick explanation for you um, around the case studies before moving over to Kerry again to talk to you about the guidance material. So you'll remember that um, there are three elements of the um, A4S ESG toolkit. The first was the maturity map that we've just talked about, as well as the accompanying guidance of how to, how to workshop that map so you know where you are and where you want to go. Um, we then have a suite of case studies that are practical examples that sit beside the maturity map to try to bring to life what good looks like in terms of practical examples. So the case studies um, cover a number of different topical areas. Um, we've got a great, it's a growing kind of um, curated collection and we've got a number of schemes that have participated they're written in the voice of the pension scheme, so they would enable trustees to understand the what, the why, and the how on different elements of ESG integration. And the topical areas that we currently cover are TCFD scenario analysis, TCFD metrics and target setting, engaging asset managers to ensure they deliver on net zero investment strategies. Uh, we've got uh, case studies that cover opportunity funds in terms of impact investing. We've got case studies on stewardship, setting a net zero investment strategy as a board, and also on member engagement in terms of ESG. If we move on to the next slide, you should be able to see um, a nice kind of summary of some of the main pension schemes that we have worked with to create the case studies. We're constantly adding new case studies here and we want to be as diverse as possible in the schemes that we focus on. 
So if there's any topical areas that you'd like to see, or if you believe that a scheme that you're involved with would make a great case study in one of the topical areas that are um, covered in the maturity map in particular, then please do let us know. Can so, I just uh, add yeah. um, on that? Um, we are very, very conscious of trying to make them as transferable and relatable to a, as wide a number of pension schemes as possible. And um, we, we do try where we can to, uh, to focus in on smaller schemes. Um, we have found that difficult to, um, to, to get the case studies from smaller schemes. There are a couple in our group, but we would love to hear from um, smaller schemes um, if they have a story to share and we can talk through what that would be and, and how we can produce um, something that would be mm -hmm. good to put on there. Great, thank you, Kerry. Um, and in the chat, Alicia has shared the link to the Bank of Case Studies on the Accounting for Sustainability website. So please do click that and take a look. Um, so Kerry, I'm gonna hand back to you to talk about the third part of the toolkit, the guidance material that we've produced. Okay, thank you. So this, as, uh, this is the third layer, um, the guidance material. So this is, because we wrote this with uh, trustees in mind, um, considering them as being time poor and resource stretched, we wanted this to be um, as quick and easy to digest um, range of guidance on specific areas of ESG integration. So they are meant to complement more granular work, such as, for example, the IIGCC net zero investment framework. And uh, they include easy to digest guides, top tip booklets, checklists, for example, on ESG integration, different asset classes, which I mentioned earlier. And the aim of these resources is to really um, help facilitate discussions either in-house across the schemes investment chain, um, so in-house across the, uh, the, the schemes investment team or outside with service providers, et cetera, highlighting key actions and steps that can be taken. Um, they are written for trustees, but obviously can be transferable to other positions alongside the, the more granular work that I've mentioned earlier. And again, we are constantly adding new guidance here and want to be as diverse as possible in the schemes that we focus on. So again, an invitation out for any, if you can have a look at the guidance material, look at the topic areas um, that we focus on and um, where you would appreciate an area that we could focus deep dive into. And then I'm just going to, on the next slide, look more closely at one of our most recently published guidance, which is our top tip for trustees, or top tips rather, there's more than one top tip, top tips for trustees on net zero. Um, this was launched in the summer, um, this, and this came along, um, accompanied uh, four different net zero case studies as well. This guide aims to uh, set out the business case for net zero for pension schemes. It provides the practical steps trustees can take. It demonstrates the peer examples, um, and it has additional discussion points around divestment, offsetting, and we brought in some testimonials. And um, so we have Denise Legal from Brunel Pension Scheme talk about how she used the IIGCC and Net Zero Investment Framework, for example. Um, it's very short, um, but it's, it's there. And we had a forward from our co-chairs of our asset owner networks. That's Emma Howard Boyd and Russell Pico. Um, and also forward from the Minister for Pensions and Financial Inclusion, Guy Opperman. So I do invite you to have a look at this um, and um, please do send us your thoughts on this as an example of the kind of guidance that we are producing. Now, um, over to um, our second poll, second and last poll, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, so when will your scheme be setting net zero targets? Um, so the answers are already have done or in 2021, in the next two years, we have not yet decided if we will be making net zero commitment, unlikely to make a commitment or don't know. Do let me know when we, um, we will close it. So uh, I think the results are in. I don't know if you can see those yet, Karen. Okay. Do you want me to run through them? Uh, no, that's fine. I think, am I right in thinking that the 35% of we have not yet decided if we'll be making a net zero commitment 
um, and and also a couple of them don't know, a couple have already have done, and some in the next few years. So there's a there's a mixed bag on this. I think um, um, in response to that, um, I think the in in the answers for those that have, who will be doing this in the next two years, then and all for everyone really, I think one of the key lessons that we have heard from pensions around when they develop their net zero strategy or whether they're going to consider a net zero strategy is one of the most important things for them was the peer um, assessment and peer involvement, peer discussions and trying to find out what others are doing and, and how they're approaching the challenges that they face. Um, if you, I, I really encourage you to read through as a first step, the top tips to have a look and get some examples and some ideas, some examples of, of where some pension schemes have gone to on that. And um, if there are any other questions that you may have around whether, how to engage your internal um, structure, internal schemes around net zero, why net zero is that important, then please do come to us and we can have a conversation about that and then map, uh, uh, connect you with other schemes who who were in that on that journey and who've got who have now maybe made that net zero strategy um, and um, can share their lessons with you and share their thoughts okay so um, moving on this is now where we were going to if you could go on to the next slide we were going to take any more questions um, specifically on the case studies um, and guidance or in general, if there are any questions around the toolkit or anything that we've said already. So if you do have, um, if you do have questions for Kerry or for M, do pop them in the box. Um, I just wanted to ask just on that final, um, what you were just saying there, Kerry. I mean, um, as you say, a lot of the challenges that are being identified in terms of you know the the lack of data and, and the lack of standardization there's been solutions um sort of announced or, or put forward and, and we're very um the plsa is certainly feeling very um reassured by a lot of that albeit it is still the case that they're a few years away in, in some instances and i just wonder for those trustees who feel as though you know 2050 is a long time away it feels like a bit of a leap of faith what what would you say about um time frames you know like what would be uh the the first point at which they should set a target for how can they sort of um embark embark on that journey without really knowing what net zero looks like and and how they're going to get there yeah well i think my first response and, and please do chip in um i think my first response to that is it's it the 21st 2050 isn't the um the deadline date here um the the focus should be on the next uh, nine years. I'm just looking down to, to check what year we're in. For the next nine years, basically, for the end of this decade, we really and and in if you look at the net zero asset owner alliance, they're making interim milestones in the next couple of years. So this this is really not about the long haul. This is really about now. Climate change is happening now. Ch climate change is affecting um, the financial sector now, as well as other parts of of the economy. So the um, the, the, the focus should be on how do we ensure that we have um, resilient funds for now and for the near future? And how do you map those alongside um, a, a setting interim targets, so to speak, to ensure that they align, those interim targets align with how you would want your, your funds to be projected in the next five years, in the next 10 years? So I think 2050 is a little bit of a um, um, confusing message because um, we will know by 2050 if 1.5 degrees Celsius um, is, is, is possible, but it, it can only start if you start now. And, mm -hmm. and basically by 2030, if we haven't reduced our global carbon emissions by I think it's 45%, then um, the 1.5 degrees Celsius is not going to be achievable by 2050. And as um, as, as it was mentioned at COP26 on the on, at the weekend, you know the 1.5 degrees Celsius is still on the life support 
so it's not been saved it's it's still oh well sorry it's it's still it's still feasible but only just yeah and did you want to add anything to that yeah I think I would just add a perspective from the sell side of the equation as well you know it's not just financial services organizations that are being encouraged to set net zero targets by certain dates it's corporations as well right so you've got an, an entire industries needing to transition to net zero and the only way they're going to do that is through the investment engagement and stewardship of their of the, their asset owners the people that own the companies so i think that there is a duty for financial uh, uh, investors for asset owners to start their own transition to net zero strategies now because they need to help the transition of the underlying companies that they invest in and they can only achieve kind of that progressive um, journey to net zero if they get that investment up front. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important not to forget that there is a transitional element that needs to happen within the industries themselves in order to get us to achieve net zero by any date and the sooner we start that the better. Indeed. Um... So I think there's a, maybe one or two more slides, but I just wanted to say if you do have any um, other questions and, and do put them in the box, we have some time at the end. I think as well, I, I don't know if you were going to ask this, Kerry, but it would be interesting to know for those who say, you know, they don't know or, or it's not the plan to set a net zero target, what, you know, what, what you feel is um, holding you back, if anything, uh, is it, you know, have you just not thought about it or do you have particular concerns? Because, you know, I, I know A4S and also the PLSA is sort of keen to uh, know, you know, keen to think about what would be helpful and, and what more we can do in this space. So, you know, if you've got any comments on that, do pop them into the box as well. Um, and Kerry, I think there was a couple more slides that you were hoping to run through as well. Uh, yeah, so if we could move on. Um, yes, so I, I think I was just um, providing a summation about um, kind of next steps from this webinar. Um, as I've already said, we would really encourage you to read through the toolkit. Um, and as a kind of first step, um, scheduling the ESG maturity map workshop session with your fellow trustees. As I mean, we only provided two testimonials, but we've had a lot of our asset owner network members um, test this out, road test this maturity map, and have found it really, really helpful in bringing others along the journey um, and understanding where they think they are around, uh, compared to where they actually are. And when then as a team working out where their priority should be and the next steps. So, and then once priority areas can be agreed on, engaging peers and reading, engaging peers, I think it's a really important thing and reading the relevant case studies or guides. So our case studies and guides, because within the guides, we include examples of pensions who've done some good stuff. Um, you've, got the, you've got the windows to these, um, you've, you've got, we kind of include the pension schemes that have done some great stuff. So you can then reach out to them. And in fact, um, we talk within our net zero top tips guide we talk about um, how many of our case study examples start with that peer um, exploration to understand how others are doing it and how they are overcoming some of the challenges um, then i would also ask invite you all to join us for our annual afres summit which is happening later this month on the 29th of november we have a, a plenary session day on um on the monday the first day it's free to join and there are many different sessions on this if you go on to our web website accountingforsustainability.org um you will see the information about the summit and we have uh, quite a few um speakers uh keynotes talking about lots of different um points around climate action around the s and esg around reporting and then uh, the last action would be, um, or next step would be for chairs. So um, if you would be interested in joining our Asset Owners Network, which is a very informal network made up of chairs of uh, pension schemes, their pooling partners, trustees and endowments, and we provide a safe space for them to discuss and explore and share knowledge um, and experience around um, how they work as chairs on embedding ESG into their decision making. Thank you. Um, 
if we do have a couple of comments, I don't think they're questions, yeah. but a few comments uh, have come in as well, just on that point as to what, you know, wh what the challenges is, as uh, they see them are. Um, Julia said that um, we have, oh, uh, sorry, my screen moved. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I can see it. If we, we have moved. bogged down in all the carbon footprinting stuff, which looks backwards rather than forwards. Yeah. Um, so the question being, well, I, I'll surmise that the question being, why is that so, or where are the forward looking um, data? And I think if that is the question, um, that is yet to come, but it's very much the top of the agenda of, of places like the UK Centre for Greening Finance, which was specifically um, so the government, if, if you're not aware, the government, um, <laughs> thank you, Julia, if the, the, the government um, put out a, uh, a tender uh, last year for um, uh, academia and organisations and NGOs to um, propose how they would deal with the issue on making consistent and forward looking data um, to make decision useful data and um, there were lots of bids around there and lots of collaboration of different associations and the University of Oxford, Oxford along with the Met Office um, as in the weather not the police um, they, um, they won the bid and this is very much the UK government's agenda on becoming the global centre for um, for greening finance, and so this is something that they are um, totally working on, and this is something that hopefully we will see develop in the, in in matters Indeed. of months. It's worth noting as well that the DWP um, climate report and consultation is open at the moment does yeah. uh, put forward a proposal that there should be a forward looking metric in uh, mandatory TCFD reports. So um, you know, hopefully that. If that if that uh, proceeds, it will um, it will sort of it, the, it will set a requirement that that data kind of needs to come through the investment chain. Um, there's another uh, another comment or another question that we have as well. Just um, companies need to continue with core business in order to make profits to permit transitions. But how long will such an or such uh, take in order to make fundamental changes? For example, uh, in relation to Shell and and other such. Um, companies what's do you have any sort of view on that obviously the the, the debate about divestment versus um holding mm. on to those assets to sort of ensure um the, the part of a real world transition well i i would say i mean and um, please jump in as well but i would say that with the core business point um you say core business to make profits the the core business will not be making profits if they continue down the road that they are continuing. They, they, and they recognize this and they are um, to a certain extent, I should say. Um, and, and so a business as usual is being more and more recognized as not being profit, not going to be profitable in the near term, medium term and long term future, um, which is why um, there are changes made, which is why um, there's a lot of um, focus being put on um, in, in changing business core models. However, say, and I say that quite delicately because obviously that's not happen happening at the pace that we need it and want it. But with regards to the divestment and engagement, um, I, I'm, 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 there, there are obviously different ways to put this, but there is a general trend that divestment on its own is not um, the right way, is not going to be the most sustainable way, as in long lasting uh, approach. And we mentioned this in our top tips and we focus on the engagement. And I would say that stewardship and active, um, active management, active engagement is, is really being put at the forefront um, of one of the solutions or one of the ways to, to support the transition. In, and there's a lot of work being going on with DWP, um, with NGOs and with pension schemes on how to enhance and improve stewardship, whether that is through um, 
pension schemes um, taking on. There's a proposal at the moment for pension schemes to propose to their asset managers an expression of wish around voting. Um, and there's, there's a lot of work going on about this at the moment, but there is very much a trend towards stewardship and active engagement um, being very, very core to this. And if I could just ask you on that point, I mean, I, I was looking over your maturity map this morning just when I was preparing mm -hmm. for this, and I, I noticed sort of one of the um, the, the higher level um, tips, so to speak, was for um, tr a trustee to attend at least one uh, AGM per year of a company they're invested mm -hmm. in. And I, I just wonder, obviously, in, in a lot, for a lot of uh, smaller schemes in particular, that might not necessarily be an option because of, you know, their invested in pooled funds and, and they might not necessarily own those voting rights. Do you think there's presumably that you've sort of set out alternative options for those schemes where they don't feel they have that influence? Yeah, it's a really good point. And may I just before, Julie, I've just noticed your comment about absolutely. I think divestment definitely needs to be the the, the stick or the carrot and the stick. And and you'll see that in, in pensions pension schemes, net zero investment strategies and, and investment strategies in general, that they, 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 do, they do include divestment as very much a part as that kind of stick. If, if, if you cannot make um, changes, if you cannot have that influence on your invested companies, then you, you, need, to, you need to uphold that divestment. Otherwise, it's an empty threat. Um, but back to your question, Karen. Um, we have seeing, we are seeing at the moment a very small but very slight and really positive uptake of uh, pension schemes um, getting involved in um, shareholder resolutions, co-filing shareholder resolutions. And we are seeing some really positive approaches to this. So if you took the Barclays shareholder resolution, um, one of the co-filers for this was Brunel pension scheme and um, we have worked with both the co-filers and oh, sorry we've engaged with both the co-filers and the company boards to understand a little bit more about um, the uh, the process how that has worked how how it works in a good way and the feedback we're getting from the boards is um, if they get a, a co-filer uh, if they get a shareholder resolution that's co-filed by pension schemes they really sit up. Um, they, they're the ones that they really want to hear from. If those co-filers um, do that in a group, in a consortium, that's the best way. And if that, those co-filers do it way in advance, then it enables them to then actually have a positive um, engagement with the, or sorry, not positive, a proactive engagement with the board so that they can actually come to some kind of resolution um, rather than being faced with it during the AGM. So for me, AGMs are not just on the day of the AGM, but they start months and months and months beforehand. They also start with consortiums with others and they have, there has to be a really practical um, and tangible request. Um, and then you can see, like you can see with the Barclays one, how it can work. Yeah. yeah. And just to add to that, Kerry, I think there's also a huge role for asset managers, isn't there, in all of this as well. So one of the lines in our maturity map talks about the way to engage asset managers. And at certain levels of maturity, it starts to talk about the expectations trustees should have of asset manager reporting mm -hmm. capabilities against their stewardship and voting activities. So smaller schemes in particular are going to be more reliant on their asset managers to vote on their behalf, etc. So that line is also really relevant yeah. to, to smaller schemes. Thank and I think, I think large schemes do as well. Large schemes rely on their asset managers. But I think it's about using the influence of the asset owner position to ensure that what the asset managers are doing is, um, is, is measuring up to your expectations. Um, and then just on the note, Julia, about um, co-filing a resolution, if you ever wanted to speak to um, Brunel about this, um, then I, I can very much make a um, connection there um, because um, they, they talk about how impactful it was. And so did Barclays, to be honest. 
Thank you. We're just uh, we're running out of time in the session, but I just wanted to ask one more question, if that's all right. It's a wee bit of a cheeky one, but oh, um, Kerry, I know you were obviously we were all um, reflecting on the events of the past couple of weeks and um, COP26 and so on. And I know you were uh, A4S had uh, were participating in or, or hosting a number of events there. And I just wonder, I mean, I've spent some of my morning reflecting on what it all means for, for pension funds and, you know, any sort of initial thoughts. There's obviously um, an air of disappointment, shall we say, uh, although be it, there was a lot of interest and, in, um, you know, announcements uh, were made during the event. And I just wonder, did you have any reflections on where we're at post COP26? Yeah, I, I, I was, I was a bit of an emotional roller coaster at the weekend. I went from being totally depressed to, uh, you know, ridiculously optimistic that we've got to where we got to on some of the the wording of the final agreement. And I think, to be honest, it, I, I think we did better than we thought, but not good enough. Um, but I think, um, I think what was really, and I, I tried to bring this out in, in the beginning, is I think it was really, um, it's really now obvious that uh, there is a mass, mass surge for um, uh, volatility on doing this. Um, there is the volition, not volatility, the, there is the volition to do this. And um, not just from government saying we need to do this, not from people saying this, but you see this from the financial sector. Um, and I think with the um, asset owner, uh, net zero asset owner alliance, um, I have been talking to them in great depth, actually, when we were in Glasgow. And um, there's there's such a um, there's such a strong um, um, level of um, review and monitoring going on to ensure that this does not become a greenwash journey. I would say that, um, that there is hope. Um, I think first of all, on the fact that you have got the 130 trillion US dollars of private capital now committed to net zero emissions by 2050, and more importantly, making interim milestones every five years. I think that's one thing. I think the other essential um, development is the establishment of the IFRS's International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, there are other key things on, you know, methane de deforestation, et cetera, et cetera, will help in general. But coming back to um, coming back to pensions, I think with the UK government's agenda and um, um, desire for becoming the global centre of greening finance, and with the greening finance roadmap really, really coming out I think we're going to see an enormous amount coming out even in the next couple of months and we already have mm -hmm. um, so I think I think there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of action that's going to be happening and I think coming back to the uh, the net zero strategy and, and and just generally looking at ESG embedment I think it's around making those um, those funds as resilient as possible to the risks of transition to the risks of physical change and also the rubber this like risks like litigation etc um so it's just super super key and um, important for pension schemes to be um considering this at the top level and embedding this into their investment uh, decisions indeed well thank you so much both em and kerry for your presentation today I, that was really um really useful and i if you do want to uh access the toolkit or any of the guides are all available on the Accounting for Sustainability website. Um, and as I say, thanks again for joining us today. I, I hope you did find this interesting and thanks for your questions and so on. Um, there is a, we've got another um, webinar next week uh, on the 25th, is that next week? Uh, 25th, um, yeah. evaluating ESG capabilities of service providers. Uh, I think Kerry will be speaking to that as well, along with some other speakers. Um, and we do have our ESG conference. We had our first one this year. We're having our second one in March. Um, so do look out for the details of that. And as I say, thanks again for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>